Good evening or afternoon. Uh, early May, coronavirus shut down world. Coronavirus open up world. I live in Missouri and I believe I understand from what I see and read that the state has, quote, opened up this, the economy. I'm not going out. I mean, you know, when I absolutely have to, I'll go to the hardware store, the grocery store, aside from that. I'm staying home, so whatever they're doing out there, I don't know. I don't see them. But um, in the course of uh, everything, it has occurred to me that I'd like to speak with you, my friends, about beliefs. And uh, I, I think our beliefs... Uh, I don't know. The, the word belief is is itself a kind of a loaded word. You know, religion is called belief. Um, I say often that I believe in uh, the uh, best knowledge we have from the last few hundred years of scientific uh, pursuit, that's a belief. But I also have a type of belief that is uh, philosophical. Actually, there's an overlap there that they, I have these beliefs in more than one way. And um, beliefs become the organizing principle of a society. I need to take a brief break here. I'll be right back. Um, you know, I organize my life around the things I believe. And that's not the same thing as saying, you know, I believe it when Nicole Wallace tells me that, that the guy in the White House is a liar. I believe that, but I don't organize my life around it. Um, because of, of the way I organize my life and because of the way I choose to appear, uh, people often mention Amish to me. And I am not Amish, and I have never been Amish. I am not a Mennonite, and I have never been a Mennonite. I have Amish friends. Um, I used to have a, a lot of Amish friends. We were never close because closeness requires something we didn't have. But we were friends, you know. We knew each other by name and we and we chatted and we stood around and talked just for the pleasure of standing around and talking, you know. Um, and uh, when I first got into horse-drawn agriculture, of course you had to go to the Amish. That was the only place to do it. And I had developed a belief I was in my late 30s, and I had developed a belief that we had taken a wrong turn uh, with our high-speed stuff. Um, I didn't grow up that way. You know, I was a hot rod kid. And used to go to the drag strip on, on Saturday night and, and drag race back when it was legal to do it that way. Um, that's a long time ago. And... Uh, 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 in my middle years, my, you know, 30s, I came to challenge within myself a lot of the assumptions that I had grown up on. You know, uh, I had fought in Vietnam, as, as most of my uh, readers and viewers know. And uh, I had seen firsthand a functioning... What I would call early stone or early Iron Age uh, indigenous culture. We called them mountain yards. I don't know what they called themselves. Um, they were not the conventional uh, Vietnamese that one thinks of who are uh, in appearance Asian, uh, uh, a slim, fine boned Asian mostly the ones that I have known. 
Um, but these people were were like uh, the natives here in America. They were they were brown, red. I don't know what color you'd call it. I find the colors they give to name to people's colors odd. You know, I'm not white. I'm pink. Um, but uh, they were small, um, and they lived uh, very close to the earth. They lived in in uh, thatch or or uh, uh, other houses built lightly out of the out of the local environment. Their houses were a few feet off the ground because uh, that kept them up out of the mosquitoes. Um, and they were light and they were airy. Uh, people would probably pay a vacation in them, you know, white people in America. Um, but they had a they had a tool that they used that was a, a kind of a, I can't see my hands here, kind of a machete thing. Um, but it was heavier, uh, heavier steel blade and heavier handle and it had, uh, they could do a lot with it, you know, it was a hammer and it was a knife and it was a plow and it was, and, uh, their agriculture was, to the extent that we could see it, uh, largely perennial. They had perennial pepper crops and they had perennial banana crops and we stole their crops and um, we didn't think of it that way because we were soldiers in somebody else's country and I I don't I make no excuses for it um, but they were as happy and, and overall as healthy and, and uh, everything is, as uh, any you know, developed country people I've ever seen, and they walked everywhere, and, and uh, I could tell stories about them all day. And, and they were just as human as we are. You know, people always tell me this mechanical crap is, is human nature. We have to do this because we're humans, and we don't. You know, I mean, they were as human as we are. They're, a lot of them are here now in the States, and I feel sorry for them. I think they were better off before we took them the modern culture. I think the life they had was better than the one we have. Um, and uh, at the time I saw them living in, in, in their little villages, you know, we were living in the jungle moving every day. So um, that wasn't what we have here. But overall, it left me very suspicious of, or it left me with a, a root of suspicion that we weren't doing this right. And uh, people, uh, I'm not sure people understand the extent to which I think that that uh, besides the uh, climate change and besides the, the ecosystem catastrophe, as though you could be besides that, but besides that, I think that our modern high-speed culture is what causes Donald Trump, and I think it's what causes uh, red states and blue states, and I think it's what causes uh, children to go shoot up their, their schools, kill all their classmates that they're able to. I think that, I think it causes terrorism, I think that most of the misery in the world today can be associated directly with our high-speed culture. Um, we have taken what might be called life in the middle, where people live a pretty good life. You know, they got enough of everything they need. They sleep warm, they sleep safe. Their bellies are full, and their and their uh, uh, children are loved, and and they just go on that way. And all the people that they really know well are within walking distance of where they live, and they really know them well. And 
people don't worry about their kids running around outside because there's no strangers swooping through who can steal them. We don't have any cars so that they're not, they can't just roar through and steal your children. It's not physically possible. So you can let all your children run around outside all day and when it gets dark, go into all the houses. People don't steal children. I think we goofed. I think that as a society, okay, develop, the developed world is, is, is a bell curve like, like the coronavirus um, infections. Or maybe bell curve is not the right word. I don't know. That was a trite thing. I just put it. It's, it's um, the United States is the core and center of the coronavirus on earth. And the United States is the core and center of high-tech developed culture on earth. I believe those two things are inextricably related. And I think that all the lunacy out there on the streets and the people parading around with guns, this is, this is very, very strange. I mean, I guarantee that there was never going to be a time if the culture that we called Montagnard in the mountains of Vietnam had been allowed to operate unbroken in its community sense, there never would have been a discussion about whether lives were worth shutting down the economy. But the deal is, ours is so broken, I don't think we can feed everybody if we don't operate the machine right now today. Now, we have to operate it, we should be operating it at a minimum. But there's nowhere around me to buy the staple foods that I eat, which are things like, like home-baked uh, uh, coarse bread without too many ingredients and vegetables and fruits and oatmeal and, and stuff like that. There's no place to buy that stuff but Walmart in Richmond. There's another little store, but they basically, they opened up to a great fanfare and we were all optimistic. But they're basically set up for old people like me who don't want to eat real food. You, you know, you can go in there and just get a thing that you take home and stick in your microwave oven and eat it. But I don't eat that stuff. So, we have to go to Walmart. So we have to operate the machine. I'm a long way around from where I started. I'm sorry, that's the way I tell stories. I'll try to get back. Um... So I decided this wasn't a good idea. And I decided, and I was about 35, more or less. I left Kansas City, bought a little farm, uh, bought some draft horses, met some Amish people, started learning things. Some of you have read some of my articles from then. I occasionally post a link to one. Um, And I failed. But I observed belief structures and organizing principles. The Amish people are organized as they are because they believe that the community of believers is central, not the individual and not the nuclear family, and not the extended family, but the community of believers. And that's everything that they do in terms of still being horse-drawn, and the things that go with it. 
are based on an internal discussion within their groups of will this thing damage our community? Will this serve to move to separate us from one another? The Amish intentionally maintain a lifestyle where they must have each other's help. They do that on purpose because that way there's, I've heard them say, you know, we need our neighbors and you need your neighbor's farm. And that's pretty much right. And that's how it's played out. You know, where you go where there's Amish communities, there's all these families and every place else there's these giant farms and empty countrysides. And uh, that is directly the outcome of the technology we chose. They knew when they made their technological, technological choices that that's what they were doing. 1930, an Amish farmer and, and a, quote, English, a non-Amish farmer looked just alike except for the facial hair. They were using the same machinery, they were using the same animals, their population densities were about the same. Some communities had all these people who had particular, specific, strongly held Christian beliefs. And they believed in adult baptism. You can't be a Christian under their belief system unless you've had grown up and thought it through and said, yes, that's what I want to be. You can't take an infant out and say, poof, look, you're, you're, you're a Christian. So they believe in adult baptism. That's the fundamental theological principle, that plus, you know, biblical inerrancy. To the way I understand it, they uh, have their own private language, which they have maintained ever since they first formed these faiths in uh, the Germanic parts of Europe. You can look up the history. It's rather interesting. A couple of individuals, how they came to be Amish and how, how they came to be Mennonites and what the difference is and all that stuff. I am not one of those people because I do not accept their religion. I admire them in every way you could possibly imagine. I have heard, you know, I know I hear a lot of people out there screaming sexual abuse. Okay, all known, all known industrial human societies have sexual abuse. I don't like it either. That doesn't count. That's just something that humans have that, that we haven't ever fixed yet. Um... I'm talking about their, what they shoot for. I'm not what I would like to be. But I have a set of goals for the best person I could see myself being. And I work towards those goals. I embrace imperfection and I know that I will fall short. I understand that many Amish people fall short, that they are also imperfect. I'm okay with that. I admire the Amish and I like pretty much all the Amish people that I know. Some better than others, but pretty much all of them because they're all nice people. That's part of their part of their belief structure is it just be decent to one another, you know. <laughs> and they apply that to everyone, not just internally, you know. You get in a conversation with an Amish person, the odds are that they're going to be polite to you and nice to you at the very worst. You can no longer say that of the so-called dominant culture. Okay, I can still remember I was a, I was somewhere in my same thirties in the same part of my life where I moved to the country. I was a phone guy. I was working on a phone system, and I had the key to the phone closet, and I walked up. And I unlocked a phone closet door and I opened it. And this door opened. And a guy came out of it and he stalked over to me and he said, You cut me off. And I said, 
He just opened the door. And he said, bite me! Turned around and stalked off. That was the first time I ever encountered someone who would interact with another person in a working environment. Russ Limbaugh had appeared on the scene. and He had begun his improvements on America. And that was one of many events which happened when I began to suspect that we goofed. But you can't just go join the Amish because you believe in their lifestyle. It Their whole thing, the reason for the lifestyle, is the religion. I, I don't believe that religion. I'm not going to lie about it. I believe that we evolved here on this planet. I believe that from the very first moment when something on this planet was alive, when that unimaginably wide gulf had been bridged from an inanimate object to living, reproducing life. From that day to now, there is no break between that first creature and everything which lives today. From that first creature and its DNA, there has never been a break between there and here. They, that creature reproduced. And those two reproduced. And that, from that, came all the life on the entire earth. Now what I'm telling you is what a science class would tell you, basically. Except I'm putting it in different words because to me this is both a, a, uh, a technical belief, like I believe that, that you know, uh, heat energy is what makes cars move. Okay, I believe that. That's, that's a heat engine and I understand how heat engines work. And I believe that. That's a belief. And I believe this science that I'm telling you in roughly the same way. But I also believe it in the way that people believe religion. That is to say, this is an animating principle in my life. That I am directly descended from the first living thing there ever was. I have a statement on my Twitter bio that a friend of mine complimented me for, and I had removed it, and I put it back, and I'm grateful to him. And that is, I am kin to all life. I mean that literally. I mean that all of us, every living thing on this planet, you, me, and the coronavirus, which is viruses are way, way out there on the edge. But they're in the life part. And we're all related through our first ever parent billions upon billions of years ago. Now that's pretty cool. And I believe it when I say in the sense that people, I think, I don't know, but I believe that people who really believe in their hearts that there is a conscious God who is aware of them and that they have been this thing called saved so that they can have a permanent life in heaven and all this, I think that they find that comforting. And I hope they do. 
And in that sense, I find this belief that I'm part of life comforting. And from there I go a step further and I say, when we begin, and this is a cyclic process, each of us who are now um, walking around, me who's speaking, you who are viewing, and all the rest of us, every living thing, everything there is starts still at, at one cell and then aggregates cells. And the primary, all those cells basically, all those cells came out of the air. This is quite literally true. There, there's a few others, okay, but the primary producers of of energy on this planet catch sunlight and they have green cells mostly green within them and they photosynthesize and they produce complex carbohydrates and uh, they put oxygen into the air and all that stuff the 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 energy that they capture and the and the physical mass that they accrete is mostly uh, carbon uh, hydrogen and oxygen dir and directly out of the air and uh, they also get nitrogen which is from the air but it's more complicated the paths that it gets there. But it is literally the truth that, that our plants, from the single cell, first single cell photosynthesizer, take air and, and make of it their bodies. You know, they, they gain some of these things through the path of the soil. But you've no doubt heard of the, the, you know, the experiments you can do where you can take a, a pot of dirt and you and you can weigh it and you can plant a seed in it and grow a plant especially if you know you grow a fairly big plant or woody plant in this pot of dirt and you can continue to weigh it and it will weigh more and more and more and more and more as the plant gets there the plants not coming out of the dirt the plants coming out of the air we our bodies were made either from eating plants or from eating animals that ate plants. Our bodies came out of the air. This body, I, am mostly made out of air. Now there are also some things out of the earth. Calcium is a metal, iron is a metal. There are some things out of the earth and uh, all those things are the things of which this body is made. And in ways in which we do not understand, those things aggregated themselves in such a fashion as to provide this awareness, as to tell you this story. This is talking air and as such I am literally in every way that you could possibly measure a portion of planet earth I am not separate from hold on I'm gonna have to get a battery charger here Okay, come on, Chica. So, what I am is, I am literally a part of Earth. And that means when my occupation of this body is over, this body will return into the 
elements of which it was made, the carbon, the hydrogen. And I will continue to be Earth. Now, nobody knows where this consciousness came from. Nobody knows where it goes. Nobody knows whether it exists or not outside of this body. I don't know either. And I don't worry about it much because whatever it is to be me is the same thing that it is to be Earth. And Earth goes on. And so I take comfort in that. I take comfort in the fact that, that I, as I sit here and talk to you, am a part of a functionally infinite cycle of uh, elements into and out of the portion of Earth which is alive, the entire biosphere. And so, um, I'm not going anywhere, you know. Uh, come win, lose, or draw, I'm still here. And I am happy to be part of this world. I, I take comfort in it. That's not, unfortunately, compatible with being an Amish person. And so I can't be. You know? um, and what I would like to find, as I would like to find people who would be interested in doing what the Amish do. You know, the Amish take an organizing principle, which is this belief in this book, um, and around it, they weave a community which grows. Their community is prospering, it's growing, um, which is resilient. I'm sure they're not suffering as badly as we are, uh, as most developed world people are from from the economy shutdown um, the uh, um, I would like to find a group of people who found being part of the earth and therefore having obligations to it to care for it Uh, to be a sufficient organizing principle around which to form communities. Once, once the community exists, land can be bought, space can be found, places, uh, places will come. The, the places aren't first, you know. The, if somewhere out there. You know, a group of four or five people got together and said, let's buy that farm and subdivide it and build separate houses on it and farm it all together as a community with donkeys, permaculture. Um, be able to live almost completely without cash, be free. You know, that's a separate topic and I'll try to get into it. But in order to build that community and, and go through, there's a lot of hard times. You know, Irish people argue just like everybody else does. You know, and there are no, there is no the Amish, okay? Amish people are separate church groups each separate church group forms their own policies. People don't agree on everything. This is, <laughs> it's part of being us. And, um, but they have, they have an organizing principle which is important enough to them 
to go through the hard parts and to say keeping this community together is worth a lot of work and um, to accomplish that and if we had communities like that we non-Amish people who are um, deeply concerned about the health of the earth beyond the level commonly called climate change activism. Um, and I know there are a few others of us out there. I mean, I some of them write stuff. Um, um, but we're scattered all over. We can't, we don't have very many, we don't have enough places where we're together. And um, we need to be able to pull ourselves together and create communities because that's how people evolve. That's, that's what we're supposed to do and that's what we can make work. Being all by yourself, we're not designed to be all alone. Like wolves aren't designed to be all alone. Or bison aren't designed to be all alone. We're designed to be in in specific finite communities and all this speed has broken them up and we have in the replacement we have this this loose community covers all the, the world and people say to me what would you do without YouTube and Twitter so that you could tell your stories to people all over the world and the answer is you know, I've got 50 or 100 people who actually pay attention to them and um, I'd rather live in a town with them all that, that'd be better you know and then I could write articles and publish them in magazines and, and the magazines could come out once a month that's what I used to do and uh, it worked fine uh, I, in many ways, think it would work better. So, anyway, beliefs. Thanks for coming along.